let me just take a moment to uh, introduce myself. Um, my name is Dave Lewis, and I have been doing security in one form or another for the better part of 25 years. And along that way, I have done everything from being a firewall admin right through to being a CISO, and um, including now. And it's one of those things, it's a type of role where you really should be wearing Kevlar when you go to work in the morning. And I do identify myself as a hacker. And if you do a quick search on the internet, you'll find that people don't really like hackers a whole lot. But you know what? We're here for a good purpose. Um, and just to be clear, I am Canadian. Uh, this is one of those really funny things when I come to the Nordics or the Baltics or anywhere like that. People say, oh, you're the other Americans. Like, mm -mm. No, no. Um, <laughs> The easiest way to identify Canadian is we're usually dressed up like homicidal maniacs and going across a sheet of ice at a very high rate of speed. But as we go f through with this, uh, if you could use, uh, did I do that right? Yeah, that's probably true. Um, in your Slido app, I can't see any of you because these lights are actually burning out my retinas. But if you have any questions, you can put them in the Slido app or there'll be some question period at the end. So that is what you need to be looking for. Oh, okay. I work at Duo Security as a global advisory CISO, which means I get to do all the fun things of a CISO without having to worry about, oh, having a staff, uh, maintaining budgets, all these sort of fun things. And back in October of last year, we were actually gobbled up by Cisco, which I, I'll be honest, at first I had a little bit of fear and trepidation, but it turned out to actually be a really beneficial thing. So today I'm going to be talking about data breaches primarily. And one of the things that I discovered when going through data breaches is notifications specifically is I found there's no common lingua franca. And uh, what I mean is I actually went through all of the data breaches that were publicly available for uh, notifications, that is, for 2016, 2017, and 2018. Um, yeah, I don't sleep much. There was no commonality between any of these presentations. It was really amazing. But one of the things I did really understand is that coffee is the only thing that was actually keeping me going. And because there's no uniformity through this, there's no understanding as to, you know, common threads that you can pull out of these things. Now, data breaches tend to show up in the media as, oh, look at the horrible things that happened and these people are awful. That's not the way it should be used. A data breach should be used as a lesson learned. Things that we can take away from that to better improve our own environments. Because unfortunately, it's going to happen a lot. And the really interesting thing about data breaches is this is nothing new. Now, before I ever got into computer security in any way, shape, or form, I was actually an archaeology student in Canada. Um, and then I realized I actually liked to be able to afford groceries, so I went into computers. Now, one story that I do take away from that time in uh, my educational background is the sack of Rome in 410 AD. And this is when the Visigoths took the city simply by out or setting up a shop around the entire city and not allowing anything in or out. After a very short period of time, the Romans actually gave up because they ran out of food, they ran out of water, and there was no way to actually get out of the environment, or get out of the uh, city, that is. And the reason this worked is because they were, had the Visigoths had used their own security paradigm against them. They had walls, they had moats, they had all the rest of it, but that did them no good when the uh, adversary decided to strangle them. And this is one of those really interesting things is we like to think about, oh, we have a firewall, everything is fine. And this is a demonstrably proven uh, false narrative, especially when you go back to 410 AD and show that this has been a problem for a very long time. Now, back quite a few years ago, this was back in 2005. This is one of the first major uh, data breaches that got published. And this was a credit card data breach of 40 million different records. This was big news at the time. 40 million records doesn't really seem like that much these days. Jump forward a couple more years, and we had the Heartland Payment Processing uh, error where they were had their systems were breached using a SQL injection attack. Now, this is the command that was being used. <coughs> Pardon me. This was a remote function in SQL databases that allowed an administrator to actually manage the database remotely. Unfortunately, for a lot of these databases at the time, this was enabled for external access. Uh, in, in one case in point, we had a penetration test done, done at a power company I was working for, and the attackers tried to get in using this particular uh, mode of entry. The really funny thing was, is I was actually watching through our intrusion detection system, and this was disabled, and I called them up, and I said, you know, this isn't going to work. It may have worked in Heartland, but it's not going to work here. And they actually thought somebody in their own company had tipped me off as to what they were doing. And I was like, no, no, I'm actually watching, which is not something they were commonly used to. But with the data breaches, this is not something that's going away anytime soon. Uh, 
I would ask you to by give me a show of hands as to who's familiar with Amazon S3 bucket, AWS S3 buckets, but I wouldn't be able to see you, so I'm going to assume that you may know it. If you don't, um, look up on S3 buckets. Now, these are data repositories on AWS that are locked down by default. These are not publicly accessible by default. There's been so many different data breaches that have been made the news because these were now publicly accessible. Now, the problem here isn't with the staff that enabled them. Because by and large, these data buckets are not set up by security professionals. The failure here is solely on the security professionals for not educating the rest of the organization as to why this could potentially be a problem. And it keeps happening. And then we have things like this where we had password spraying attack against Citrix. Now this is not to cast dispersions on any of these companies, but it's to show that these type of attacks can literally happen to anyone. This is an organization that 98% uh, of the Fortune 500 use. And unfortunately for them, they were actually compromised. And this is one of those things that we have to be aware of. Data breaches are something that tend to be huge fodder for the news, but don't really resonate with us until we experience them ourselves. Case in point, if your house is burgled, you usually don't have a security alarm until that happens or somebody close to you has their house burgled when it becomes uh, something prevalent. Now imagine this data breach happens to your customers. Imagine you have millions of customers. And let that sink in for a second. This is not a fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This is preparing yourself for how you're going to handle it. These days, data has become the new oil. And there's a lot of truth in that. It is the currency of the day. Now, no slide presentation would ever be complete without it. something to do with AI. And if you can gather what that reference is there, I give you a high five. Um, this is one of those things where the attackers will eventually get to the point where they're going to use artificial intelligence in order to launch attacks against your sites. But let's be honest, they don't need to do this at this point. We make it far too easy with them, for them. rather. We use uh, static usernames and passwords, low-hanging fruit, vulnerabilities that haven't been patched. There's been far too many times I work in organizations over the last 25 years where the Oracle patch release for that particular quarter had not been applied oh, uh, for the last two to three years, usually because the DBA says, no, this is my data, I don't want you to touch it. But we're getting to that point now where computers will be a far more um, prevalent adversary than we previously thought. This here is actually from the DARPA Grand Challenge a couple of years ago in Las Vegas. This was on stage just before DEF CON, and I work uh, as part of the speaker operations team for DEF CON. We were trying to set up, and along here, let's see, does this have a laser on it? Doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's find out. So right along here, each one of these is a supercomputer, and they're water-cooled, which was amazing, the huge hoses behind them. But all of these systems were in the process of attacking each other. One of these systems created brand new vulnerabilities that nobody had seen before, or exploits that no one had seen before. So the system had taken it upon itself to create a new attack. And this is one of those things that we have to understand that yes, we will get to that point, but the attackers don't need to leverage that sort of thing right now. But one day it'll be a real thing. So I'll just skip past that just in case anybody has any issues with bright lights. And when I'm talking about that, about making the attacker's job easier, how many people here are familiar with Equifax? I think I can see people now. Do I have a show of hands of anyone who is familiar with the Equifax attack? Okay, I see a few hands go up. This is a company in the United States. They also have operations in Canada and UK, uh, which is a credit monitoring service. Now, in this particular case, they were compromised, apparently compromised through a vulnerability in struts, but this is one of those really interesting things that the uh, journalist Brian Krebs, he went out and found that you could actually get the exact same data in roughly um, a dozen different countries using a web interface, using a default username and password. I think it was admin, admin. So the thing is the attackers are not going to use an exploit to get into your system if you leave stuff like this hanging out in the open. And these are the kind of things that we see that lead to these various issues with regards to the security or environment. But we don't really tend to talk about these very much within our own organizations, about the missing patches, about the log reviews, things that we should have been doing all along. So one of the things that I found really interesting a long time ago, uh, actually not a long time ago, uh, in recent memory, was the Star Wars movie Rogue One. 
I'm a big Star Wars fan since I saw the first movie in the theater in 1977. Yes, I'm old. Um, but it was really interesting. We went through this, and I looked, and I said, this is very analogous to a data breach. We have the firewall admin, and if you haven't seen this movie before, I do apologize. So we have the firewall admin that's trying to marshal access to the systems. There we go. And then we have a failed authentication of the rebel ship trying to gain access to the planet. And it's like, okay, well, no, really, we are the right people that need to be there. We're going to employ some social engineering to convince you. They said, okay, fine, send the code, launch their SQL injection attack. Let's see, is it successful? Yes, they gain access to the planet. They have been able to get in. And once they gain in, get in, the attacker needs to escalate that privilege. So they managed to find a way to gain more access to the environment and see how they can move around through the uh, victim systems. But the funny thing is, is the attackers are getting away with a lot before any of the defenders happen to see what's happening. And the indicator of the compromise usually are far too late. And then by that point, it's already done and done. The attackers have the data that they're coming for. And it's really funny because depending on what type of report you're reading, um, the numbers can vary, obviously, but between 180 to 250 days is the amount of time that it takes before anybody notices that their systems have been breached. Then we have the egress filtering where the data is being removed from the environment. There it goes. And the really interesting lesson here is that you need to encrypt your data. The funny thing is, is they were able to grab that, upload it to a nearby spaceship, and, well, they were able to see it was plans. There was no encryption keys involved whatsoever in this particular case. So if this is in the future or in the past, it really does show that this is a problem that is prevailing even in that time space. So now back in 2012 on my own website, I started tracking data breaches because it fascinated me how they were coming at such a uh, brisk clip. And in one particular case here, we see, doo -doo 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 -doo, LinkedIn came in at almost six and a half million records at the time. That was a big number back in 2012, even when you take out uh, Heartland and the other data breach there of the 40 million plus records. But this just keeps growing. And I know how painful this is because I suffered through my own data breach at one organization that I worked at back in the mid 2000s. This was one of those moments where I got to work and it was roughly nine o'clock in the morning and my phone was already ringing off the wall and I picked it up and it was the CBC, which is a, natural, a national news organization in Canada, Globe and Mail and various other publications. And then the American publications started calling and I'm like, okay, something is very wrong here. And it turned out there was a web server that was run by marketing that was supposed to have been taken offline two weeks previous. They had promised to take the system offline two weeks previous. And I thought, okay, this has got to be a joke. Sure enough, they had not taken it offline, and we, had been, oh, I'm, there we go, and we had been compromised. This was one of the most unfortunate experiences of my life. And if you've ever been through one of these, I understand the pain. If you haven't, I hope you never do. This is something that was avoidable and nothing to do with the people that said they were going to take it offline. It was incumbent upon the security team to follow up with them and make sure that we closed the loop and that system had been taken offline. Now, at my previous job uh, at Akamai, we went through and we had all sorts of data from attackers around the world that were coming across our platform. And that platform was absolutely massive. We had something like 275,000 systems around the world that were monitoring. This was a quarterly breakdown of attacks that we would see for web applications, SQL injection, lo local file inclusion, and cross-site scripting. These three, <coughs> pardon me, these three quarter over quarter were almost the same every time. It would vary by a, a percentage point here and there, but it, almost every single quarter it was identical. And why? Because SQL injection continues to work. Attackers are able to leverage this, and this is something that we can fix. This is something we can fix. One more time, this is something we can fix. If we sanitize the data inputs and sanitize the data outputs, that will go away. This will take away the attacker's foothold. Now, a couple years ago, this was um, the data breach landscape. This is from a site called informationisbeautiful.net. If you're not familiar with it, check it out. It's really cool. They do this visualization where we have this. That was two years ago. This is a couple months ago. And because it got so cumbersome with everything jammed together, they were good enough to update the look and feel of their website. But then again, that is just amazing. We can do better. And it always feels like everybody seems to want a data breach when you look at how many of these are happening. 
we need to use proper security controls because not all security controls are the same. We need to really look at things that are avoidable. Now this is from WannaCry a few years ago and the problem here was this was leveraging a vulnerability that people had known about for 10 years. 10 years, this is something that, we, that could have been dealt with. So you have to look at the costs involved in the event of a data breach. You have to look at what is going to cost you for the investigation for the incident, the cost to remediate those findings. In one organization that I worked at, we had a vulnerability assessment done of the organization. They found all sorts of issues within our environment. And the person who was in charge of the IT uh, management system framework, he said, yep, we'll just accept the risk. This is not a good way to do things because this becomes a security debt which you can accrue. And over time, you have the compound interest applied to that security debt so that when you're ultimately compromised, it is far more painful than it ever has to be. What's the cost to recover? Now, if we look at the Sony Pictures breach a few years ago, they had all of their systems were bare metal, basically. What is it going to cost you to recover in the event that your environment goes down? Whether or not you're on-premise, uh, using Azure, using AWS, Google Cloud, whatever it happens to be, you really need to sit down and do that assessment. The one thing that people usually don't talk about is the communication costs. Are you a, com a startup that is just running on private equity? Are you have, do you have shareholders? What, like, what is the framework that you are working within? And what's it gonna cost? And who do you have to notify in the event there's a data breach? I've seen companies that tried to completely push it under the carpet and pretend it never happened. And other companies like Citrix did a great job of getting in front of it and said, look, this is what happened. These are problems and these are how we're gonna fix it. Kudos to them for that. You then have to consider what are the legal fees that are involved? So depending on the type of data, depending on the penalties that could be associated with it, whether it's GDPR or some sort of healthcare data, these are the things you have to consider is what is the potential worst case scenario. And compliance penalties as well. Also, loss of revenue. This one always gets me. One organization that I worked at years ago, a, the CEO sent out an email. Now this email was announcing some rather bad news. The deal was, and it said clearly in the email, do not forward this. Within the first five minutes of that email going out, 47 copies were forwarded out of our organization. Unfortunately, the security team had no idea this email was going out, so we couldn't put any controls in place in time until about 10 minutes later. By then, the damage was already done. One of those emails went to the press. The stock dropped 5% in the next hour. Got to really consider these um, costs. And also your stock valuation. The really funny thing is, and one of the organizations I work with called Securosis, we are a boutique analyst firm, um, we went through and we looked at data breaches and how it affected the stock over time from uh, multiple organizations. The craziest thing, though, is most of the organizations that were breached, ultimately their stock recovered and in many cases improved. But these data breaches do have a significant cost if you try to hide them. So, for example, here, when Verizon was looking to buy uh, Yahoo!, they did not, or Yahoo did not disclose the data breach they happened quite a few years earlier. And as a result, when it came time to have the um, conversation about cost, they actually took a haircut on the price of the organization because Verizon said, if you don't dock this amount of money, we're not going to buy it. And ultimately, they agreed to it because they had not been forthright with it. It's a whole lot easier to be honest about it and upfront as opposed to trying to cover your tracks. <coughs> Pardon me. So TalkTalk Talk was another example where the data in their organization was not encrypted. The person in charge of security said, well, we don't have to. Why should we bother? This is a really unfortunate, broken way of looking at things. And as a result, they had to pay a fine of about 400,000 pounds at the time. So now, in your organization, imagine you've just had a data breach. What's, it going, to ha what's going to happen to your organization? So for example, Who's going to get a pink slip? Now, this is using Equifax as an example. We have the CISO, who retired. We have the CIO. What happened to the CIO? Retired. We have the CEO. I'm sure the CEO was fine. Nope. The CEO, the CEO retired as well with a $90 million US parachute. The really funny thing is the CISO in that particular case had been with the organization for about four years and for some magical way had made $11 million in that four years. Obviously, I'm not working for the right company. 
But for a minute, pause. Imagine this is your organization. Imagine this is your data breach. Imagine you've just lost almost all of your senior management. What do you do? And while I'm using Equifax as an example, this is not to beat up on them. This is just used as an analogy. So for example, they're not alone. Let's see if this works. Yes. The very next day, their competitor, TransUnion, was now serving up malicious software that was made to look like a flash install. That was roughly a day later. So when you're going through all the different types of things with regards to a data breach, you know, panic is not supposed to be any of them. One of the things you should do is make sure you are prepared well in advance before this ever happens. There are certain organizations within your company you should work with. One of them is compliance. Compliance, as much as people like to grump about it, um, is a very, very key piece of the puzzle. They will help you. So you can use them to help understand what, is the, uh, what are the necessary things that you need to be addressing before you ever have this sort of issue? And hopefully it never happens. Often they're the adult in the room when you're having these conversations, like what should we do? You should have them look at your data breach response plan. Do you have an incident response plan at all? These are the things that you need to address. And this can happen to anyone. So back in the 90s, or is it in the 90s? Geez, no. Back in the, yes, back in the 90s. This was uh, an incident where one of my sites came under attack and I was working for, uh, you know, I'll be honest, I was working for a defense contractor at the time in the United States. Oddly enough, they didn't seem to have a problem with me being Canadian. This was a case where there was one particular site that kept attacking and I was getting fed up because they kept coming after a client with no ramifications. I hit back. I went after them, I scanned them, I got into their system, left a note, said, knock it off literally was almost exactly what it is, left a burning email address saying, you know, feel free to drop me a line. Uh, a couple days later, I got an email. Thank you for the note and thank you for pointing out the vulnerabilities in our systems. We do appreciate it, but just so you know, wrong IP address. And I went, what? And I went back and I looked and I had gotten one of the octets in the IP address wrong. I had hit the wrong site entirely, but they were really good sports about it, thank goodness. Um, but this is one of those things we have to understand is that hitting back, attacking a site, going after it is not a good way to do it. And unfortunately, uh, peers of mine within the industry do have a tendency to try and advocate on hacking back. <coughs> Excuse me, but this is really not something that you should consider. Unfortunately, these sort of things can happen to anyone. So back in uh, about 2008, 2007, I was working for a company where a vulnerability management firm called me up and said, look, we would absolutely love to sell you our product. Can we just scan some of your IP addresses so you can see a sample report and let us know how we do? I said, sure, go for it. And they said, okay, great. What class C are you using? I said, well, <laughs> we're using class Bs. And he re immediately regretting his decision. Um, but he did a scan of the entire class B, gave me a report. Um, one of my staff printed it out. It was about that thick. I was really unhappy with uh, wasting that much paper, but as I'm flipping through it, sipping my coffee in the morning, I kept seeing all sorts of printers. And I'm like, <coughs> pardon me, gotta get some water here. And I was a little bit perturbed to see all these printers because I knew in our organization, we really went out of our way to make sure that we weren't exposing something as trivial as a printer. And then I noticed the IP addresses for the various printers were showing up in Shanghai, Chongqing, Beijing, all these different places where we didn't have any operations. I went and looked at the IP address block and sure enough, they had done exactly the same mistake I had done for years earlier. They had gotten one of the octets wrong and they had gone and scanned an entire class B of China. It, it was one of those things. So it's just, mistakes can happen. So that's why you need to always prepare. You need to always be ready for in the event that something goes wrong. Because thankfully, as far as I know, nobody hit back when they went after them uh, in China, but that could have ended very differently. Now, <clears throat> when you're talking about security and you're talking about security within your organizations of various dev groups, you have to make sure that they understand what you're trying to articulate. So for in this particular case, I had one uh, project at a power company and they had gone live, they were in production, and they said, oh, we need a security review. And I went, this would have been a good conversation to have yesterday. So. I sat down, I took the web interface. This is not the actual web interface, but I did view source. How many people are surprised that you can do view source with a browser? Thank you for not putting your hands up. 
So this right here, right there, that. I did view source on the application. Can you imagine what I found in the code? Commented out in the HTML was the username password of admin and the password of password. And this actually gave me administrative control of the application. So still traumatic to think about it. So their reaction when I showed this to the manager for that application development team was you, you hacked my application. He actually didn't understand that you could do view source in any browser. He honestly thought that I broke into the website. My reaction internally was this. Thankfully, not externally, because I would have felt like I'm about to shot my foot off, but it really hit home to me at that point that at no point I had discussed with his team or his organization security concerns that we might have. Unfortunately, in this particular case, the application went live before we even knew about it, but we were able to take it offline and remedy the issue. <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. Um, and the issues uh, are not specific to any one application. Sometimes when you fix something, it can get unfixed. This is from another company that I was working at on uh, their developer website. I left the company about two weeks later, a former coworker of me called me up and he said, you are not going to believe this. He said, go to this particular web page and right up here, use the uh, variable Etsy password at the end as your argument. It dumped the entire Etsy password file for their production server. This was something that was fixed before I had left the building. Once I left the building, they went, ah, Dave's not here anymore. We can get rid of that. Thankfully, they fixed this when I took the screenshot and sent it to them because they didn't want to end up in the newspaper. And that's just it. People are going to use tools in ways you never imagined they could. And you have to be prepared for that and how to deal with that. And sometimes they will ask for tools that do absolutely nothing but look really neat. This is from a now defunct company that would have a, a map with showing all these different attacks. The reality is, is none of these have any value to you as a defender. And sometimes data breaches can happen to people with the best intentions. This particular company, and this is not to beat them up, the first time I ever gave this talk, this particular thing happened roughly about an hour before I went on stage. Their entire site was popped, never did find out what happened there. But these data breaches can happen to anybody. And my friend Bob Lord, who now uh, is in charge of security for the United States uh, uh, Democrats, he used to be at uh, Yahoo, and he suffered through his own data breach. And he described it as vertigo, and that's just it. I really agree with that assessment because when our data breach happened, there was 192 accounts on the system that were publicly exposed. Of those accounts, none of them existed in our production environment, but the damage was done. We had the reputational risk had been brought into the mix. It was an extremely unfortunate example. Bob suffered a whole lot worse than I did. And sometimes things will happen when you don't expect them. There was the Morris worm uh, back years ago that was let out and it did a whole lot more damage than the uh, creator ever intended it to. And that's just it. Mistakes will happen. And this is unfortunately how most security practitioners see the world. It's an us versus them. And we tend to align against ourselves, and this is something that we need to do a better job of as security practitioners, but also to actually communicate better with others. And another example is a group that we should be working with, everyone that is, is your internal audit team. I have experienced internal audit teams in the past that were absolutely horrific nightmares because they really were keen to have my scalp hanging on a wall, but there are other ones that got it. They were there to improve the situation. They were there to help do a better job. And again, this was a case where I was able to take our incident response plan and work with a couple of these companies, or so a couple of these organizations with the companies, and the audit function, they were able to go through and they said, well, what about this? What about this? It was a sober second thought. It was really good in that respect. And they can work with compliance. So if you're looking to get your uh, application out in the DevOps world and you want to get it out in a smooth way, you want to make sure that it's going seamless. So that makes sure you're avoiding any of the roadblocks that you come, come into. You want to deal with compliance. You want to deal with audit. You want to deal with folks like your procurement team to make sure they know that things are coming. Because if you can prepare all of this in advance, when you try to go live, it'll be a whole lot easier. 
Now, I talked about communications having that earlier. Making sure you have a good way to deliver bad news is really key. If you are not able to get ahead of the message, the narrative will develop without you. And trust me, that's not a place you want to be. When you're talking about zero-day vul zero vulnerabilities, the news loves to pick this up. And I admittedly, when I've written for organizations like Forbes and Dark Reading and things like that, I have made that mistake of chasing the zero-day, oh, shiny. But the problem is the real issues tend to be the 100-day vulnerabilities I refer to, the things that have been known about for a significant amount of time that have not been addressed. If you're running an application on top of a deprecated version of PHP, you are literally sitting on a time bomb. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? Honestly, you've got to start where you are. You need to do a risk assessment of your environment, whatever that happens to be. You want to make sure you have an asset inventory. You want to make sure you know the users that are in your environment. So you have to take wherever you are and work from there. Maybe you already have a mature organization that already has all of this in place. Maybe you're bare metal and you're just flying by the seat of your pants. No matter what, this is something you need to address. Otherwise, it will take over for you. Patching is another thing. Far too often, people like to say, oh, just patch it. It's never that simple. Patching your systems is key, but don't be in a rush to do it because sometimes it'll break things. You need to do regression testing. You need to make sure that all these things, and you need to have a plan in place of how you're going to address it when these problems do arise. You need to figure out a way to stop the threats earlier. Making sure you have a defense in depth. Network zone segmentation. Making sure that things that are supposed to be internal only to your environment are locked down. You have multi-factor authentication on all your systems. One of the really interesting things I used to get was, oh, we have to innovate. Every time it was like, oh, we have to innovate. This is before I moved over into the vendor space. And it was really cool because, yes, I get the idea and security should be there to enable the business. But sometimes they were asking us to build the airplane while it was already in flight. And this is a really frustrating aspect of things. And the thing is, if we don't, as security professionals, get ahead of the narrative, then this sort of thing happens where we have uh, people on various news organizations talking about, uh, hacker's name 4chan when it was actually a messaging board. We need to learn to let go of the systems that we're working on. So one of the things that uh, most people do in a administrative role or a DBA or a security role, they tend to be very protective of the systems they're working on. In one particular organization, I was working on an intrusion detection system, and in that particular system, I had built it all from scratch. I didn't let any of the teams patch it. I took care of everything myself, and I thought about it. What if I got hit by a bus? I didn't want to be the single bus problem for the organization. And my uh, mentor at the time said, well, you have to learn to let go in order to grow. So whatever it is that you happen to work on, you should be able to let that go and to move on to grow and move on to the next thing. And this is one of those moments where I learned that I had to trust others in order to get my job done. Now, trust is something that is earned. So in this particular case here, this was a story where I was working at a company that had a global footprint, MPLS, MPLS circuits around the world, because they seemed to think that was a good idea. In one particular shop in Malaysia, we had people that were downloading movies, crack copies. We got a rather nasty gram from the MPAA in the United States, and I thought, okay, how is this happening? Because when I looked at the log files, there was actually no indication that these downloads were happening. <coughs> Excuse me. And yet they were incredibly insistent that it was actually happening in that office. So we had one of our guys that was in the region go to that particular office and went in to have a look. In that particular case, the folks in that office had set up a stub router to go around the firewall. So they were actually downloading directly from the internet and we were not checking the edge router. We were only checking the firewall logs, which was a huge oversight on our part. But this is how they were able to do it. This is how they were able to download all these particular files. So again, like I said earlier, when you give people tools, they're going to find new and exciting ways to break things in ways you just didn't imagine. And a data breach can be both a blessing and a curse. You have the curse of the staying up all night and trying to figure out the problem and try how to remedy it, and the blessing of, okay, these are the things that we need to fix, and yeah, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Now, one power company I worked at, this is one of my favorites of all time. So 
this particular power company used to be part of a larger organization. At one point in time, they took that company and split it into five smaller companies. One of those companies was ostensibly a competitor of ours. So we didn't really get along all that well, even though we were friendly. And in this particular case, we went out on the raised floor because we found there was a, a strange routing loop that was happening that we were getting errors on. And it was for a device that we'd never seen before. So I thought, okay, this is great. So I took the tile lifter, lifted the tile, nothing there. All right. Lifted the next tile into the three floor, nothing there. Third one, lifted it up. There was a Cisco router underneath the floor blinking back at me that I had never seen before. I took a step back and I just pointed. My coworkers that were standing there with me were absolutely gobsmacked. Turned out that that router was something that was not documented, but existed from before when the five companies were one. No, since there was no documentation to actually point to that, it took a while for us to unwind that that was a direct connection between our company and our now competitor. Thankfully, our now competitor didn't know about it either, and they were extremely vexed when we pointed it out to them. That could have gone so badly for both of us. So we dealt with it. And this is one of those things is you have to constantly be vigilant, whether it's your code, whether it's the libraries that you're using within your code, you have to look at all the different steps. OpenSSL was a great lesson that we learned with the Heartbleed episode a little while ago. How do you know the libraries that you're using are up to current? That's one example. How do you know that static passwords are not going to be breached? How do you know when they are breached and they're being used, they're legitimate accounts against your site, even though an attacker already has them? Multi-factor authentication would fix that. So there are various different things that you need to consider. Now, that being said, I would love to say, Acho, thank you very much for listening. I hope I said that properly. And if you have any questions, uh, in addition to right now, if you want to talk to me later, feel free to drop me an email or you can find me on Twitter at that particular uh, address.